Well, hello, my name is Mike Calco, and I'm here with Eric Biggers, my colleague, and we're going to present on FS Verity. Um, now, we're just presenting on this, but this is actually um, an effort that, that's um, being contributed to by multiple people, including Ted So and, and Victor, who, who's also here from, from the Android team, um, and so forth. And so uh, we've started out with um, some design work um, about a year ago. And I'd like to say any, any good parts of the design um, came from Ted. Uh, <laughs> any questionable parts, I'll take the fall for, personally. And then code-wise, uh, anything that's good uh, came, comes from Eric. Uh, and anything questionable you see in the code, again, I'll take the fall for that. Um, and so uh, just by way of background, uh, you know, I've, um, I originally wrote eCryptFS. Um, some of you may have heard of it. Um, and I apologize every opportunity I get for having done eCryptFS. I'm sorry. And, and I've since um, also done uh, FSCrypt, uh, which is the, uh, together again with Ted and, and other contributors, um, that's the native encryption capability in EXT4 and uh, F2S, F2FS. And if anyone else who's interested in um, integrating FSCrypt, of course, always interested in having a chat. So we're going to talk a little bit about taking measurements of contents of storage, DM Verity, and then doing integrity and authenticity in the file system. Then we're going to introduce some of the work that um, we've been doing with FS Verity and what some of the use cases are that we have in mind. So really at the, at the core of all this, it's about taking hashes. And, um, you know, we take measurements of contents of storage in order, in order to establish identity. And, um, you know, a hash is, is, is a trapdoor one-way function. What that means is we take a pre-image, um, which can be of arbitrary length, and you run it through this hash algorithm, and you end up getting just a few dozen bytes. And those few dozen bytes can reliably, uniquely identify the thing that you're taking the hash of. What you can do then is you can do a verification of the root of trust. Um, against a root of trust for that few dozen bytes that you generate from the hash algorithm. When you take a hash of an object, you measure the entire thing prior to taking further action with that thing. Um, there can be significant latency on initial access of it, especially if it's um, a large object and if the computational uh, resources of the platform are limited. If you take an initial measurement of this whole thing, you uh, can validate it before you even begin access to that thing, which is a really nice security property and oftentimes a requirement given on, uh, you know, given what your, uh, what your security um, adversarial model looks like. However, there's no further revalidation of the contents coming from storage after that initial measurement. And so if you have a malicious data source, such as a file server or, or a disk or controller firmware, which um, has been attacked in some way, um, then you can play games uh, through this man in the disk, so to speak, and make changes after the initial measurement. There are firmware attacks. You can look up things like equation drug and grayfish and so forth. This is something that's been around for quite some time. Um, and it is something you have to worry about um, in several contexts. So an alternative way to taking a measurement of the entire object all at once is to use an authenticated dictionary structure. Now, there are several different structures that exist, and they have various pros and cons depending upon what your usage requirements are. Um, but one of the common ones is a Merkle tree. And with a Merkle tree, what you do is you segment what it is that you're measuring into chunks. You measure the individual chunks, and then you take the measurements of the measurements all the way up to some top level. And so um, what this allows you to do is to take a partial measurement while ensuring comprehensive validation. Because all you need to do is do a signature against the top level of the authenticated dictionary structure. And after you access some subset of the object, you can say, well, at least the part that I've looked at um, has been validated against a digital signature, which is done on the top of the data structure. When you first access the object, 
the time it takes um, latency-wise is a logarithm of, of the object size because you don't have to read the entire object before you begin access to it. Now the trade-off with this, of course, is that IO errors are possible while you're processing the file. So this allows for an attacker to be creative by injecting faults in the middle of the file that you're accessing and thus having some arbitrary manipulation of the execution of the process by virtue of the fact that you've gone a certain um, uh, amount of computation, you've uh, generated a certain number of side effects, you've um, impacted the environment, maybe sent out some network packets or what have you, and then bam, you get an IO error and you can select where that IO, IO error occurs. And so um, that is uh, a concern when you're, when you're taking this particular approach. So how many people who have Android devices? When you turn on your phones, how, how many of you get this, something that looks like this? Okay, a surprising few. Um, this, this is what you see um, because uh, when, when, you, um, when you disable Android verified boot. And so this is um, a feature of Android where we take the system image and we've generated an authenticated dictionary structure against um, this system image and pushed it out. And then we have some keys which are uh, in, in the secure environment on the, on the platform that are used to validate the root of this authenticated dictionary structure or Merkle tree. Um, and, and if uh, you're unable to validate the authenticity of the system partition, uh, then we give this warning saying, hey, look, we don't know what's on your phone. Uh, all bets are off. This is accomplished with DM Verity. And so this has been around for a little while. Uh, DM Verity sits in between the block device and the file system. And it protects all file system content plus the metadata. So the user generated content or, or the contents of the individual files or inodes, um, you know, those are protected. But in addition to that, everything associated with that with the file system like the block mapping, uh, the D entries, and so forth. All of that is also protected, which is a very nice property to have. Um, and it's something in general I recommend you have if your uh, environment allows you to do so. But not every, as we're gonna discuss, um, not every environment is amenable to that level of protection. So if you have, for example, a mobile platform like Android, you have an ecosystem, you have partners, uh, you have different regions, different devices, and so forth. Every incremental update to the system partition requires regenerating the entire auth tree. And you'd somehow have to pack that together, uh, the, the, uh, all of these updates with system image updates. And then when you deal with this Cartesian explosion of, of devices and updates and versions and so forth, you end up getting something that's very unwieldy. It's, it's intractable uh, to be able to keep all of that authenticated in the way that we'd like. So we start looking at the file system as a way to, um, to address this issue. And what we talk about is partial disk authentication, where selected parts of the file system, uh, that is primarily the file contents, are validated using these authenticated dic dictionary structures. And so this facilitates um, you know, incremental updates of arbitrary subsets of the file system and significantly reduces the complexity in deployment. Of course, the trade-off for this um, is that the file system metadata is unauthenticated. And so there could be opportunities for people who are more creative than I am to find ways to manipulate the um, block mappings or the D entries, directory structures, and so, so forth in order to trick applications to behave in ways that they weren't intended to behave. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Eric who will talk about some of the more technical details of FS Verity. Okay, so uh, so now we get to FS Verity. Uh, FS, FS Verity is basically DM Verity for individual read-only files. Uh, it's implemented at the file system level. Specifically, it's part of the file system, but also most of the code is separated out into its own 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 module that is shared by multiple file sy systems and. 
So far, we've implemented EXE4 and F2FS support, but it could be supported by other file systems too in the future. Um, and FS Faraday is not yet up, ups, 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 upstream, but we are, but we are working on on it. And I, and I, um, and I sent out, I sent out the first version of the kernel patch set a few days ago, and and anyone is wel wel welcome to 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 re review it. Um, so the contents of a file using FS Faraday look 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 like this. There's the original file contents, then potentially a bit of padding, then the mark Merkle tree. Uh, the size of the Merkle tree depends on the settings used, uh, but with the defaults for large files, it's approximately the original file size divided by 100, 129. Uh, sm small files do have more overhead due to the padding. Uh, then after the mark Markle tree, there is a small structure called the FS Faraday Descriptor, which contains some additional metadata, metadata fields like the hash algorithm and the block size used in the uh, Markle tree. And similar to DM Verdi, all the FS Verdi metadata, including the Merkle tree, is written by user, user space ahead of time, and the kernel only reads it. Uh, we've written a user space tool which sets up this, which sets up this meta data. The simplest command is just FS Verdi setup and then the file path. That appends the metadata to the file using the default settings, which are the SHA-256 hash with a 4K block size and without any signature included. But there are options to change these set settings if you, if you, if you want to. Uh, also, like DM Verdi, you set a block size, usually 4096 bytes, and all the hashing for the Merkle tree is done over blocks of that size. Uh, also, the root level of the tree, which is always only one block, is stored first in the file, and the leaf level, which we call level zero, is stored last in the file. Uh, the leaf level is the largest level since it gives the hashes of all of the data blocks. Uh, the other important metadata fields stored on disk include the block size, hash algorithm, and the original file size. Uh, there's also a way to store variable length fields. Those include the root hash of the Merkle tree, optionally a salt to salt the hashes, and also optionally a PKC PKCS7 formatted digital signature of the file measurement. Uh, so it turns out that the Merkle tree root hash by itself is not uh, sufficient to reliably identify the file contents because of the other metadata fields like the hash algorithm and the block size and the original file size and because of the padding that's needed at the end of the original file contents. Uh, so what we actually do is we hash the, the root hash together with these other metadata fields, and that gives us another hash value, which we call the file measurement. And the file measurement is what FS Faraday actually reports as the, as the, as, as the hash of the file. Um, as I mentioned, the FS Faraday metadata is written by user space. Uh, afterwards, there's an IOCTL to actually enable FS Faraday on the file by setting the FS Faraday bit in the inode. The user space command to do this is FS Faraday enable. And once FS Faraday is enabled, the file becomes read only and the Merkle tree and other metadata becomes invisible to user space. So user space will only see the original file contents. 
Um, also, file systems are allowed to move the metadata to somewhere else if they want to, like into a file stream if the file system supports that. But um, but f for exe4 and f2 f f fs, we're just uh, we're just keep, keep, keep keeping it past the end of the file co contents. Um, so to implement FSFarity when reading data, we hook the file system's read pages function, which is the function that reads data from a file into that file's page cache. If the file is an FSFarity file, when a read from disk completes, but before unlocking the pages, we have the file system submit the pages to a work queue, which calls into the FSFarity module uh, to verify the hashes of the pages. To do that, for each, uh, for, for each page, FSFarad reads any needed hash pages from the file and verifies the hashes starting from the root node of the Merkle tree and this descending to the appropriate leaf node. And finally, it verifies the hash of the uh, data page. And as an optimization, each hash page is also cached in the page cache with the bit saying whether it's been verified or not. So since there, since there are many hashes per hash page, for usual I.O. patterns, most data pages get verified without having to read or hash any additional hash pages. And we do not allow direct I.O. on Verity files, since that would bypass the verification. But we do support encrypted files, in other words, files that use both FSCrypt and FSVerity uh, simultaneously. Um, so FSVerity is essentially a way to measure or hash a file in constant time subject to the caveat that the, that the verification against that hash happens on demand as data is, is read, and applications, applications will receive an I.O. error if they try to read from any corrupted part of the file. Uh, and FSFarad file measurements are available in the kernel but are also exposed to user space via an IOCTL. And with the user space utility, FSVRD measure just calls that IOCTL and prints out what the kernel returned. Um, so there are various use cases that can be, that can be supported or enabled by the FSVRD mecha, mechanism. The simplest is integrity only to detect accidental co corruption, and for that, for that, all you have to do is turn FSVerity on. There is also the auditing use case, where you log the file measurement before doing something with the file, like executing it. Uh, and finally, there's the authenticity or appraisal use case, where you have a known good file measurement either from a digital signature or from somewhere else, and you validate that the actual file measurement matches the expected one. And that detects both accidental and malicious changes to file contents. Um, there, there's been some confusion about the relationship between FSVerad and IMA, the integrity measurement architecture which already exists in the kernel. Uh, the difference is that FSVerity is a lower lev level thing, uh, basically a way to hash a file, whereas IMA is focused more on higher level things, like what is the policy for which files are measured and what should, should be done with the measurements. Um, so in general, FSVerad is not replacing I IMA, and, and in fact, we're planning to have IMA uh, s support getting its me measurements through FSVerad on files that, that use it. Uh, so that should allow I IMA users to take advantage of FSVerad, uh, for example, for I IMA audit or for I IMA uh, appraisal. 
Uh, how, however, we have found that uh, some users find FS Verity to be useful on its own uh, without IMA. So it will also be supported uh, to use FS Verity on its own and just do things with the file measurements in user space via the IOCTL I mentioned. And we're also considering supporting a mode where you can configure FS Verity to enforce that all file measurements are signed by a certificate that has been lo loaded into the kernel. Uh, that mode is maybe still up for debate since, since it does overlap with IMA a, a bit, um, but, but, but we do have a, a user who is asking for, for, for it. Um, so in the IMA use case, this is a rep representation of what I, IMA does today. today. Uh, Essentially, when I, IMA needs to measure a file, for example, because of an open or an exec, uh, it, just, it just hashes the entire file, which causes a long latency before the operation can proceed. And this is what IMA is planned to look like when it's used on FS Verity files and configured to support them. Um, it's the same as, as before, except the actual hashing of the file contents is replaced with just asking the file system for the FS Verity measurement, which allows operations to proceed without waiting for the whole file to be hashed. Um, so if, if, you're, um, if you're interested in FS Verity, uh, you can try out the kernel patches um, uh, and you go to space, you tell Putty uh, uh, and help review the patches, uh, which, uh, um, uh, which, uh, which, as I mentioned, I sent out a few days ago, and they uh, and 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 they uh, and and they add support for FS Verity to EXE four and and. F to FS, and we've also been working on tests as part of the XFS test file 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 system testing suite. Uh, so this this concludes our presentation, and and thank you for your uh, attention. Question. Can you talk about performance impacts on IO? Okay. Um, would you like me to? Yeah, yeah. I can answer if you want. So the performance for smaller files is going to be a little more um, uh, impactful because the, the amount of space that we take for um, the tree structure is one block, which right now is fixed to the page size, which for most architectures are you know, 4K. And so you're going to wind up amplifying the I.O. as a result. However, <clears throat> you also get um, uh, some characteristics of storage that help mitigate that, uh, such as read ahead. Um, the person who's best equipped to give fine details about this is sitting right here, <laughs> Ted So, and, and I'm sure he'll, he'll give a little more context uh, on that. Okay, um, so in general, it's going to be no worse than DM Verity uh, for large files. Uh, DM Verity also has some significant performance impacts if you're using it on hard drives uh, simply because you're seeking a lot uh, to read the Merkle tree. Uh, in practice, the root of the Merkle tree will probably always uh, be cached, so that's not a big deal. Uh, but some of the intermediate nodes and the leaf nodes don't get used as often, and so they very often will be pulled into disk. Uh, in practice, this has not really been a problem uh, on flash devices, because on flash devices, you know, random reads are much less of an issue. 
Uh, I think we've been a little bit more worried about the CPU impact um, of actually doing the hash, uh, especially on some of the lower end uh, Android devices that just simply have you know, a CPU that doesn't have a whole lot of oomph. <clears throat> That's right. Yeah. So the, uh, I think it's Goldmont is the Intel architecture that has the SHA-2 acceleration, um, and so that helps. Um, since we are targeting mobile platforms, we do uh, expect that there's going to be additional power consumption as a result of um, the frequent hashing, which you know we, we anticipate is going to be a benefit because these trusted APKs uh, for these privileged applications on the platform, uh, they're currently measured. Uh, at the time that the APKs are installed and validated. Um, but then after a device reboot, and so, you know, they're not revalidated. So anything could have happened to storage. We expect that's going to be a good trade off. So you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the problems with having um, with having verification be done uh, rather than on the entire file but on individual blocks is that you can have EIO at a, basically an arbitrary point in the file and, and screw it up. Um, is there any mitigation for that that you have, or, or did I miss it? It's, it kind of feels like the nature of the beast. If you're going to delay verification to the point of access, um, then then you know there there are things there are tricks you might be able to play if you want to try to um, detect that there has been an offline attack against your storage. Um, it may not necessarily be something that'll be at all helpful for a man in the disk where you have a, a, a compromised controller that can fake uh, the results arbitrarily at the time of access. But you know, when, when you bring the platform back up, uh, we've imagined scenarios where perhaps you could have something in the background that gradually reads the files and does nothing with the reads except just reads the files. And and but but then so, you're just in a race condition and, and you're not necessarily getting strong guarantee, security guarantees. Yeah, the, the other thing to note here is that for the uh, initial use case, we're using it for privileged APK files, which basically means the class loader is going to be loading a class at a time. And so if there are, if there is a failure, it will probably be as you are loading a class and not at any random point in program execution. Um, and so that mitigates that somewhat um, for that particular use case. Yeah, but it's very much uh, user beware. Uh, you need to be aware of, of the benefits and, and trade-offs um, of using uh, complete measurement of the file prior to the start of any access at all versus validation after you've begun access. Uh, so with DM Verity, we added forward error correction to prevent uh, random bit flips from uh, you know, preventing your system from running. Are, are you doing the same thing for FS Verity or considering something like that? We've, we have, we, we've considered it. We, we haven't implemented that. That's, that's going to be for um, you know, a, a future version, I think. But it definitely is something that you want to consider doing so you, don't, um, so you can mitigate uh, the uh, incidental bit flips as opposed to the uh, malicious bit flips. So how do you exactly protect against uh, a man on the disk? Uh, as far as I understood, you're still storing the Merkle tree on the disk, so the man on the disk could modify that while system boot up to uh, correlate to the bad changes in the file. Are you using some kind of cryptography and making sure to store the keys to that uh, signature uh, off the disk, or how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. And so it has to do with, um, you know, what, it, what is the profile for the entire platform? What, what, it, what is your uh, secure boot process? And, and how are you utilizing things like secure elements to get key material into the proper locations, right? And so you have to consider that in your adversarial model. And you have to make sure that you get your keys from the trusted source, the secure element of the platform. Then what, what FS Verity is actually doing is, is we're, we're creating something called an FS Verity measurement which isn't just um, you know, the contents of the files themselves, but it's also the metadata, um, including, including the tree. 
Um, and so the, the root of the tree, uh, together with the descriptor, which is the metadata that describes the characteristics of the FS Verity file, all of that is captured in the root measurement, which is the thing to be validated um, against the key that you get from the secure element. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the other thing to say here is that measurement, uh, again, for this initial use case, will be digitally signed, uh, and the key to verify that uh, will be in the system image, which is protected by DM Verity, and the key for DM Verity is in the kernel, and the kernel is protected by the trusted bootloader, and so for that initial use case, that's the chain. <laughs> yeah, in the next session, we have a panel on uh, hardware root of trust type issues. So one, one question I had was whether you had thought about attestation of that appraisal uh, that you perform? We haven't thought about attestation. Uh, in general, attestation terrifies me. But yes, um, <laughs> so you're talking about linking with the TPM and, and, and doing PCR measurements based on... Uh, yeah, take, you know, do it, sending the, uh, the measurement off to be validated. Right, um, and binding to PCR measurements and so forth. Yep. For, that's not a requirement for the Android platform. It's an interesting use case, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll consider that. Uh, so I, um, so I'm, I think uh, how I th how I th how I think we um, we we might be able to get support for uh, for for that uh, when when we add uh, uh, when we add I I. When we add IMA support, <laughs> Mimi's nodding over there. <laughs> IMA person. Yep. Any more questions? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay.